Ale, 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 ale. Alof, alof. Af, f, ein, unter, ein, in elf, f, mari, unien, aia, uien. Replendecemos. Como astros, ahí, y el año, el, 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 ale, 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 aluf, 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 af, f, an, u, L Ale 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 Hello everybody, my name is Nicole and I'm here just to give some sort of like introduction to the introduction um, and I wanted to give you some context. First of all, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for listening. That piece that you just heard is a sonic poem that is called uh, Mapunauta, Nampungwan Bulenfe, and it's a sonic piece that I de developed in collaboration with a dear friend and collaborator, Daniela Catrileo, a Mapuche artist and poet. So we developed this piece in order to think about what are the multiple and the other voices that are involved in space exploration and the space imaginaries that we produce around outer space, <laughs> sorry, the redundancy. So this poem starts with the um, research around Mapuche cosmologies and their relationship to outer space beyond only understanding how they use uh, their knowledge with and their relationships through calendars, for example, with celestial bodies, but also how Mapuche people, that are one of the main ethnic groups in the south of Chile, the country that I come from, uh, how these people, they actually have multiple, uh, they inhabit multiple dimensions, and one of these is the Wenumapu. So the Wenumapu is the dimension of the outer space. And in this multidimensional existence, they are actually already inhabitants of outer space. They have been there before uh, what we call in our uh, uh, contemporary culture, astronauts, cosmonauts. And this is like a poet, a, a poem that comes a lot from the idea and the imaginary from, for example, astronaut culture and other diasporas of thinking these ways, of thinking about space exploration and outer space, not only as a place with uh, objects and bodies that are there for possible structures or settlement, but also 
these are bodies that carry a lot of wisdoms and knowledge in order to create different ways of relationships with human beings, natures, and other ways to be more transversal with also the universe and the cosmos. So, as you might know, today in Chile, uh, there's a lot of like social and political conflicts. Uh, there's a big crisis. But for example, Mapuche people, they have been living this crisis from hundreds of years already. So also, doing this poem, in working with this line of research around ancestral cosmologies, not only it's about including the multiplicity of voices around uh, how humans re relate to outer space um, and the, the diversity within, but also it's about creating some uh, pieces of art in order to create alternative futures that can also change how we interact and resignify our presence. And for example, a piece like this one for us, is, it's a way to uh, bring some uh, pride to, to kids, to Mapuche kids, that are usually thought to be ashamed of their culture, they're thought to forget about it. But if they understand that they are on the verge of science, that they are also space travelers, it's a different way to relate to that. So with this piece, uh, I invite you to think about also uh, diversity and the multiplicity of voices when we think about outer space. And thank you so much for being here. Now, uh, Christian Sim is going to introduce the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole, Nicole Lullier, uh, for a different introduction to space. Don't you think so? How many of you actually are dreaming or have dreamed of being on the moon one day. Wow, that's lots of future astronauts. <laughs> well, I think that's, that's pretty much a passion that most of us have in common. And, and those that are a little bit older, you know, we might even remember when the first man landed on the moon. And in a way, it, it, it opened our minds to lots of new things, to lots of new ideas, to the possibilities, to the future. And that's a little bit what SwissNex also tries to do. So my name is uh, Christian Sim. I'm the CEO of SwissNex here, and I have a wonderful team that uh, actually put all this together. SwissNex is a, it's a strange thing. It's a, it's a complex animal. We, we try to gather rather faint signals that are coming from the future. We try and understand what are the forces that are going to shape our society in the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years. And we, because these signals are coming from various sources and because they're not very precise, they are still out there, it means we don't have a real language yet to talk about them. And that's why we've, we usually bring in people from very different backgrounds. It starts with artists, for instance. They have their way to talk about future. But we have, we have researchers, we have professors, we have students, we have startups, we have large companies. We have the policymakers. We have all these people that are shaping, in a way, where we go. And SwissNex's work is to, to help, in particular, the pair of the North America and, and Switzerland to have meaningful conversation about these important subjects for the future. Um, and we try to find also interesting places to do it because we are strong believers that the place has an importance. That's why we all dream about exoplanets. You know, if it would be just a dust piece on, on the floor, it wouldn't be that interesting. But it's an exoplanet. So that's what we're also going to hear about today. So with that little introduction, so Swiss Next, well, you got it. It's complex. It does interesting things. 19-year-old startups, next year, 20 years. And um, this event tonight, we did it together with another organization, actually a campaign called Swiss Touch. You know, in a way, putting people around a table or in a room or just around a glass of something, coffee or whatever, to have these meaningful conversations is something that Switzerland has always been very good at. And that's what Swiss Touch, sim Swiss, Swiss touch symbolizes. It's bringing these people together. And with their help, we have been able to create the event to today. And there's lots of other partners, but that's my colleagues, uh, Francesco and Jonas, who are going to explain it to you. So thank you very much for being here. 
Thank you very much for being part of the journey and see you on Pegasus 51. <laughs> Who knows? Thank you, Christian. So uh, our CEO just asked you uh, a couple of questions, and I also have a question for you. My name is Francesco, and I want to know who among you has a Swiss watch? Not on you, but at home, maybe somewhere in a very safe bank vault. Okay, so all of you have a fantastic piece of Swiss machinery that is the result of a very long tradition of high precision and high technological expertise. And that is the foundation of why Switzerland is such a relevant nation also in space, but it's not very well known. Could you tell me what you see uh, over there? You see an astronaut, but you also see something else. What do you think that is? Any takers? There's a spaceship, yes, a lunar landing module, but there's something that looks like a flag. And that is actually a Swiss flag. Th that flag was a, a solar composition uh, experiment that looked at how uh, the solar radiation affected materials outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And that experiment went up with five Apollo missions, and it was led by the University of Bern, which is one of the two partners, main partners from academia in Switzerland that we have here tonight. And uh, that has been, if you want, one of the little starting points of Swiss space exploration. And then on the other side of the image, we also have a planet, a planet that has some little dots next to the Swiss cross. And those dots are there to represent, in a way, the spectrography that people that look at for exoplanets work a lot with. And so those are just you know, two very significant images that speak about Switzerland in the past in space exploration, but also the present and the future. And the planet is a representation of the great work that has been done by Didier Callot from the University of Geneva, who had just been awarded the Nobel Prize for physics for discovering the very first exoplanet together with two other scientists. It's hard to come. <laughs> it's hard to come back from that when the mic doesn't work and when I don't have as great a metaphor for, for the Boston ecosystem. But maybe by, by show of hand, how many of you are working in a space related field? So there's quite a few of you which means that Boston is actually a great place for us to bring this evening to and to have this conversation in because I think I could throw a few rocks out into the city and likely hit some people that are working in space. And this is one of the things that makes this a very special place. Now, doing events like these don't just happen because we have special people that are working and leading the field and uh, discovering exoplanets. But uh, it also takes a great team. And so uh, I want to do a quick acknowledgement to uh, the entire Swiss Next team that has come together to put together the event tonight and tomorrow. And in particular to Francesco, who has done an incredible job in making sure that all of you will have a fantastic evening tonight. So please, a round of applause for the team and for Francesco. And, and so you might ask, you know, what are we doing tonight? Well, tonight we are looking not just of what has been the Swiss contribution to past uh, space exploration and what they are doing down, but also what we plan in the future. But as Swiss Next, we always want to try and have, you know, future-facing and thought-provoking conversations. And tonight we also want to have a conversation that goes beyond Western-centric ways of understanding space, which are sometimes very scientific, very you know, squared and numeric. We also want to look at alternative and indigenous cosmologies. The piece that you just heard from Nicole Louyer was a, you know, a perfect example of how other peoples, other culture can think about traveling to the moon. And yes, tonight we're gonna have a very interesting conversations. There might be some aliens involved at some point toward the end. So uh, stay tuned. And yes, Jonas.
I think we can now pass the floor to Kate Green, who will kick us off uh, for the evening, right? Yes, Kate is a very interesting person. She's an essayist and poet. She works in the, teach in the writing program of Columbia University, and she's also been the second in command and the communications uh, head of one of the high seas missions uh, run by NASA in Hawaii, basically replicating uh, human settlement on Mars. So she is as well versed in space um, uh, topics as anyone that will be here on stage after us, uh, I should say, tonight. And also she is a former laser physicist. So Kate, please join us on stage and uh, take it over. Thank you. It's a true pleasure to be here. Um, and that uh, Swiss flag on the moon was kind of a plot twist, wasn't it? Wasn't expecting that. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, our two keynote speakers tonight. And I just want to get to it because I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. DDA Kilo is a professor of physics at the University of Geneva and at the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. In 1995, Kilo dramatically and forever changed planetary sciences with Michel Mayer by discovering the first planet outside our solar system. This year, together with Mayer and James Peebles, Kilo was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery Willie Benz is the director of the Swiss National Center Planet S, dedicated to the study of the formation, evolution, and characterization of planets. He's the principal investigator of KEOPS, the first small mission in ESA scientific program, with the goal of studying exoplanet formation due to launch next month. In addition, he served on many national and international committees, and in 2018 was elected president of the ESO Council. Kilos and Benz were both students of Michel Mayer at the University of Geneva. After their initial observations, Kilo and Mayer contacted Benz for his expertise in planetary formation. They wanted to know if it were actually possible for a planet as large as the one they observed to orbit so closely to its star. Indeed, it was. The rest is history. I'm so pleased to introduce these two shining lights in the field of planetary science and to hear what they have to say this evening. Please join me in welcoming to the stage first DDA Kilo, followed by Willie Benz. Thank you for these nice words. So um, what I will try to do with you is to give you a little bit of a story back, what happened 25 years ago, the reason why um, got awarded with Michel, the Nobel Prize, and James Peeble for cosmology. Um, and I want to try to describe how this was done and um, what makes this so special and why we've been successful when other has failed before. And I would try to give you a little bit of a flavor um, what it was such a change and, uh, and a, a kind of perspective and, and where we sit today uh, on that topic. So in a way, it's really the amazing hunt of exoplanet, and you will see why, because I think this field is just amazing the way we stand. So we have to start the story somewhere, and I want to give you um, the time zero here of um, how do you set up an experiment that is going to look for planet? Well, actually, amazingly enough, it's, it's a bit of a matter of uh, having the right people at the right time, having the right interest, for doing the right and the, the kind of instrument you have in mind. And, and the story is here in 1988, brings you quite back in time. And you see here uh, kind of my telescope, which is the Observatoire of Haute-Provence in the south of France, beautiful area of France. It's almost a two meter class telescope there. And this telescope was built in the 60 centuries. And uh, at that time, the observatoire was looking for a kind of new machine uh, to install behind uh, to get a little bit of a boost into the science of the site. And, um, and then uh, to get a feeling what is old telescopes, this is kind of 60s telescopes, but still a good telescopes. 
And the, uh, the director of the observatoire at that time decided he would need a spectrograph. Well, there's many ways to do a spectrograph. And what happened is uh, to another telescope next to it, which is a one meter class telescope that Willy Benz knows very well. He can tell you maybe some story about that one. Um, there's an, a machine on the, on, the, on the back of the telescope, which is called a Coravel. Coravel was really the, the main instrument that Michel had developed in the 70s. That was a kind of a machine that could, for the first time, measure quite efficiently the speed of the star. So why do you want to measure the speed of the star? Well, actually, what you could do when you measure the speed of the stars, if there is something orbiting that star, whatever it is, it is going to change the position of the star and is going to change the value of that speed. So there will be a variability of something that we call technically a radial velocity. That's the technicality, but that's the kind of the speed of the star we measure. So Michel was doing that because he was studying what's called binary stars. And, um, and the idea was, well, let's, let's try to do better than this machine that was limited in accuracy. He had about 100 meters per second accuracy, which is good to do stellar physics, but certainly not enough to detect a small object orbiting a star like a planet, for example. So to give you a, f a flavor, Jupiter, you need about 10 meter, that's the effect of Jupiter, our own planet, uh, uh, on our sun, uh, the star of the sun. So they come up together and they say, let's do something together and try to build an equipment uh, that is going to do both at the same time, the spectroscopy and then also the radial velocity. So this is how LED was born and this is how I start because I was I joined at that time and my task was to help to set up this instrument and to build a wool data processing machine around that uh, to process that kind of data. At that time, it was a new, it was a kind of a new design because the design was supposed to be compact. This gives you an idea what it was in the uh, in '92. I love this picture because on the back you see a, a, sh a chair. That was my chair. I used to sit here most of the time, going back and forth, back and forth with the train. At that time, I had no car. Uh, Observatoire de Provence, Geneva. It's a nice five, six hours train and helping to set this up and set up this up and just building the instrument. So this is, this is a job and this part of this when you assemble the machinery and that's how it looks like. So at the end, we had this uh, beautiful machine uh, somewhere in the basement of the telescope. We were connected with the fiber to the telescope and uh, you see all the insulation, it's like a satellite. Uh, it's just to protect from, from thermal effect of the, the machine because we wanted the machine to be very, very stable, to be very accurate. So at the end, we ended up with something like that. This is open right now, this is a machine as it is today. So if you visit, if you visit the site, you will see that, this historical piece which is there. They open the cover in a way for you to see what is inside. And I would like to just drive you to a couple of elements here to understand how revolutionary was this instrument at that time? Well, the first piece of optic, this is an instrument that produced high resolutions. What does it mean? It means you will build a kind of a rainbow. You will stretch the wavelength as much as you can to see all the tiny detail you have on the spectra of the star. And when you want to resolve, it's called the spectral line, which is all the atomic uh, species you have in the atmosphere of the, of the sun that absorb light and produce a lot of, sig of, of, of signal that you can use to compute the, uh, the speed of the star using the Doppler effect. So the machine was a kind of a very compact design and we use a, a main piece of equipment, which is, which is that one here, which is a grating. It's a very special grating that was the first of the whole series of the grating that has been developed later. And all the telescopes in the world right now are using that kind of grating, but that was the first time it was used. It's called an R4 grating. We were the first one to have it. And I remember I was very worried about this piece of optic and Michel told me, don't worry, it will come because there's a long list of other users of bigger telescopes that need it anyway. And we just have, we are just the first one. And that's why we were a little bit try, kind of uh, pioneer here. It gives you a lot of wavelength, a lot of capability and a very compact spectra. So we had this device here, which is optical fibers. So why is it so critical to have optical fibers? Because it's a trick you use to make sure the light at the entrance of the machine is extremely stable. It gives you a high accuracy and gives you a potential to reach exactly the value you need to detect a planet. There is two fibers because we find out during the installation of the, of the machine we can use one to correct for the other one. Now, it's not enough for the discovery. The big change was this machine. At the time, in the 90s, you may be familiar with that, a brand new architecture came up on the market. They were the 22-bits computers. They were the Spark 
spark chip, and they came from the, the big Cray machine developed in the 70s. But uh, sound microsystems are the first of that kind, and from the beginning, we decided to go to this machine, and, and I developed the whole code in a way to analyze the data on that machine. That was a big breakthrough here, because with this machine, we could process the data with the optimized uh, uh, infrastructure within the time scale you would observe a star. Almost, actually, because we play a trick, we realized it was not fast enough, and I remember we tricked the CPU speed of the machine to make sure we would process the data in 20 minutes. That was exactly the time to observe a star. We were observing a the star, then getting the data down, crunching the number, and while we were observing the next stars. In that way, we had in the real time the data coming up and the real time data analysis. And that was the key for the discovery. And then the whole stuff together, we would be able to reach an accuracy of 10 meter from the day one. So at that time, other team were trying to do that, but they, they really were struggling to get this, this level of accuracy. While we were very late in the process, but the machine was absolutely a revolutionary machine. So what is happening right now is 25 years later, the machines are still the same than this one. Of course, they're much better. There's a new series of equipment that has been built on, on, on the top of that, but they have the same design. Fibers, air, air for grating, same kind of systems, the way you operate with the data analysis. So in a way, that was absolutely a revolution of machines. And that's the key for the discovery. So the other part of the discovery is how we run the detection. So to give you an idea of the time scale, this is from the, the paper. And you see the time, which is here, organized along the phase of the planet. You know 51 peg B takes 4.25 days to go around these stars. It was absolutely unusual and absolutely surprising. Um, and the data point are the one that you observe after uh, starting uh, the, um, the measurements. So the, the, at the beginning, we had this just these four points on the top in September, uh, November 94 that were enough to get an idea that something was wrong with the star, but not enough to really kind of start to really uh, have a very aggressive campaign on that. But I, when I saw this data, I get very worried because I realized it is not exactly what I was expecting with the machine, because I know this machine could deliver much better. And when I came back in January, I kept observing the stars, and then I completely panicked because every day, every night, I was observing the stars, and the data went up and down, up and down in all directions. And at that time in January, I started to think that maybe there is a structure. First, I felt there would be a big bug in the program. There was a lot of stress for me because I was building this as part of my PhD. So I feel really obsessed by this. Uh, since Michel was, was in sabbatical the way, I really, I really wanted to solve that before kind of going to them. You know, I'm, I'm so shameful. I just messed up completely my work. So I really get obsessed by that. In a way, I would understand what was going on. And after fighting a lot with the data, I realized there was nothing wrong with my code. It took me quite a lot of work to end up with this conclusion. But at the end, the only way to make sense to that was to fit an orbit. And then we came up with this idea, there must be a planet. So I came up with a planet solution here, and I talked to Michel. Michel was very nice. He told me, well, I mean, maybe, let's see when I will be back. But then when he came back in April, he told me my planet could not exist. Because a Jupiter has to be where Jupiter sits, which is far away, and at least you have to expect 10 years to go around then the stars, and there's a good reason for that, because there's a full formation mechanism, which is backed up on the, if you analyze the, the, uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter, you find out that the ingredient in the atmosphere tell you Jupiter, our own Jupiter, is formed at that distance. So who could you end up with a planet like that? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I explained to him what I did. At some point, he got convinced that uh, actually it, it's awkward, but he kind of agreed with my conclusions, but it was so awkward, so we decided to wait July, and in July, I had my orbit, my planet orbit, and we went with Michel, then Observance, and then you see all the data points that were exactly matching, matching the prediction. At that time, we were both, I mean, I was more confident at that time, and Michel got completely convinced about the planet, and when we published this, and this is his story. So what happened at that time, I mean, it was not a revolution, because Practically, I think nobody believed that planet. It took us quite a time, and to get a sense what is happening, I have to, to drive you through the detection of the planet. So in 95 to 2000s, the world were skeptical. Because 
first, there is no prediction by the theory. You have to trick with the theory. You have, to got, you have to add something to explain that. But then there is also suspicions that maybe this is the atmosphere of the star that play a trick with us, and, uh, and we have not really considered properly the atmospheric uh, stability of the stars. People were mentioning pulsations, and, and, and plenty of reasons why that would kind of go against the planet hypothesis. We have good reason to believe it was wrong, but, but when you have the whole world against you because it's so awkward, I think until 99, nobody believed that. I must say, on a personal ground, that was extremely difficult for me as a PhD student, because, because I realized that all the work I've been doing, nobody practically believed that stuff, except a small club of people. And I decided to put that in the back of my mind, really, and to go ahead and to keep doing something else. At that time, I went to US. I experienced, I experienced working in interferometry, other work, because that was really a kind of a sad story. Then in 99, everything changed, and the first transit was detected, and the world kind of woke up. And other people came up, and you see the rise of the of discovery. And then in, two, 20, in 2005, the first transiting detections. What happened is because we had so much of this short period planet being detected, the likelihood of a transit becomes so high, then people started to realize they could just use any, any telescope and look for transit. Well, the big change was after 2010, and you see this increase of detections, absolutely dramatic increase of detections, and that was because of Kepler. So Kepler was a game changer here, because Kepler, I mean, I mean flowed really the community with planets. And it was at that time that the planet community uh, started to grow from about a couple of hundred people up to you now a couple of thousand people. And, uh, and the, the kind of global aspect of the search for planet became real. And that's why it took some time, I mean, to capture all this. And the reason why it took some time, because all the detections we've made are really awkward. So to give you a very simple picture why it is so awkward, the best way to do that is to show you one diagram, or maybe two diagrams at the same time. <coughs> Here you plot all the planets as they are known today, on just with a few parameters. One of them is the, the distance or the period of the planet, how much time the planet needs to go uh, on, on its orbit or on the stars. One day, 10 day, 100 day, 1,000 days, it's a logarithmic scale, so be careful. Everything you move away, you just move further away. And the idea axis, depending when you look at, there is one term which is the mass, which is roughly what you get when you d use the radial velocity techniques. And the other one is the size. So I didn't talk about that, but when you have a transiting planet, and, and, and uh, Vili will talk about that later, um, you, you get the size of the, of the planet here. So you see the size from one Earth, then Earth. The mass is, is one Earth, 100 Earth, and uh, maybe I'm going to help you to read this. Um, this is where Jupiter sits. This is where Earth sits. This is Jupiter, and this is Earth. So there's a lot to say about this diagram, but I would like to focus on this just key message. Well, the first key message is 51 peg would be around that position here. You see it's very different from Jupiter here. Well, but that's not the only one. There's plenty of others. And when you compare to the solar system planet, they practically would all be around his dis this location there and all the planets being found are different. So we are very lucky, in a way, that the planetary system are very different from the solar systems, because otherwise I would not be talking to you today. <laughs> the planetary, we may, we may still have people figuring out how to find planet. I'm pretty sure that Kepler would never flown uh, without, without having a couple of discovery before, and even if he would flown, he would, may not have detected any planets. Because, because a planet like, like the Earth are kind of out of the scope for Kepler. So it's an interesting situation we are because we're celebrating so much discoveries, but all these planets are really, really different from the solar systems. And if you ask the question how likely it is to pick up one of these planets in the sky, if you look at the star right now today, I mean, it's not obvious on this diagram. And uh, if you consider the hot Jupiter, the one that like 51 peg, it's called this Jupiter's object, whether in size or mass and short period, couple of days, it's about a few percent. So they're pretty rare. So we had 20 stars, and we detected one. So this is the kind of luck we had in the detection of 51 pegs. We had to find it, but we have been a little bit of a luck. There's a little bit of piece of luck in the detections, but it's not too much, because that's the that's typical rate of finding this planet. But the big surprise was to look at the other bunch of planets, which are this regime here, that start from the Earth, go up almost to the mini Saturn, 
There are plenty of names. We call that super Earth, mini Neptune, Neptune, I mean, mini Saturn. Depending on the kind of funding agency you ask for money, you change the name. <laughs> and uh, and the, the typical occurrence rate of this planet uh, is of the order of 50% up to 80%. It means that when you observe a star tonight, if you see the star, well, there's a, about one of the two stars that have a planet like that. And you see they're very different from the solar system. They some have the size of the solar system or kind of mass of the Earth, a bit bigger, uh, but they are much, much closer. This, all these compact systems, and some of them, I mean, quite a lot of them, they, they show up in, in multiple systems. So that's a big challenge right now, because we have a lot, a lot of planets, but we're not really sure to understand what they are exactly. So there's a bit of a trick we can do with these two diagrams. We can put them together, because some of these planets, they have at the same time a mass and a size. Um, and that, you get the density of the planet. So that's the that's, uh, that's bread and butter of the test missions that we'll be talking after, try to work on this. And when you, when you do this kind of, oh, sorry, before we do this kind of um, exercise, I would like to just mention that we have the, uh, the, uh, the Jupiter, which is over there, uh, which looks like kind of on Jupiter. There's no Jupiter detected in transit because it's just very unlikely it could the transit. But when in high velocity, we have a couple of them. So we have 10% of star that seems to have planet like our own Jupiter. It's a bit of a caveat here because most of them, they have a very eccentric orbit, so they may not look exactly all on Jupiter. But there is some object that may be similar to the solar system if you only look at the Jupiter planet in these systems. So um, before moving to this, to this density, I just would like to just say something about the lack of detection here. There's a bit a lot of debate about how likely it is to get an Earth in, into this regime. So people have been trying to play games, trying to extrapolate any of these diagrams here to get a feeling how likely it is to find an object like that. So there's a famous diagram that's been produced out of, of, of Kepler, which is due to a Batala here, which is trying to explore the, uh, the, the, the occurrence of a planet within 50 and 300 days. Um, depending on the size. So you get a pretty good idea about 10% when you move from down to that size here, that's all you end up with 80% in total. But as soon as you get below 1.5, 1.2, all this becomes um, just, a, um, there is no constraint. And uh, you use a kind of a constraint solution, you, you would kind of extrapolate uh, into the solution, but you don't get any constraint at all. So the practicality as of today, if you're asking me, what is the occurrence of an Earth? that kind of look like the Earth, the number can be between almost zero up to almost um, 50%. Because we know already that they are 50% different. So that's also something interesting to bear in mind. We know that 50% of the star, they have a planet which is different. So, and then that's the one we don't really understand very well. While there's still the open uh, possibility that the other 50% will be on Earth. And there's a lot of effort to go in this direction. So I mentioned the density. This is how it looks like when you combine the two together. It's a very fascinating diagram, diagram with a lot of astrophysics here. I don't have time to go through all of this. But practically what you get is the mass in solar mass, sorry, in, uh, in uh, Earth mass, and then the size also in Earth mass. So to help you to see through this, this is the, the planet we have in the solar system. So you see we have, in terms of density, we have planet that looks like uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, they are what's called the giant planets. Uh, they are planet that looks like in density and, uh, uh, and mass and size about Neptune. And there is even some planet that looks like the Earth. This planet are very, yeah, I'm almost done. The, this planet are very short periods, so there's nothing like they're very hot usually, um, but, but they still look like this. So what's interesting to think about is assuming you move around the density, you can take the Earth and move uh, the Earth keeping the same density. So you can have the same Earth, but just a little bit more massive and then a little bit bigger. If you maintain the density, you maintain the same kind of characteristics. So you can play around, and practically all these objects, they may be like the Earth in terms of density. It doesn't mean it's Earth-like, but they have a density similar to the one we have on Earth. So you can play the same trick here. That would be the water density. So actually, the interesting picture, some number to keep in mind, I mean, uh, um, um, if you would uh, dump Jupiter or Saturn onto the water, Saturn would be floating like a boat, when, uh, and, and Jupiter would be sinking, because Jupiter is, more, is more, a bit more denser than the water, it's below the, the curve. Otherwise, this is where you would go the water. So water is here, uh, the rock is here. Neptune is just in between. It's a mixture between the two, 
and that's an intermediate density you have here. So a lot of question is what are these systems, and frankly we don't know. Um, if you zoom in even on the smaller mass object, and uh, getting into this Earth math regime, this is one Earth mass and ten Earth mass, and this is two Earth size, and then you can be a bit more uh, um, uh, detailed on the on the probability. What I mean on the, on a model, what it, it may be, and and you see here an Earth-like system when it would lie. So there's a couple of systems that looks like Earth-like, but for the very same mass, let's say five, you can also have system that looks like uh, water, ice. Kind of, it doesn't exist, but just just a planet full of water and ice. Actually, you always have a mixture of core and dense core, and and you can also have planet even more fluffy that looks like more um, uh, Saturn and mini Saturn. So for a given mass right now of the object we're detecting, which is a couple of times the mass of the Earth, we can be facing a, a kind of mini Saturn to a Neptune object to a kind of mini Neptunes, and down to a super Earth to Earth, and even worse, what's called a bare rock of iron. So all these questions are the reason why we have now an aggressive program which is, which is ongoing. Uh, that's the reason why I was here for a couple of months to visit MIT, where they're flying tests, which the main purpose is to get some understanding about that. And that's the reason why, I mean, we will soon be flying Keops, is to improve this and, and then to understand much better what are the system we're talking about for later on trying to push further out and to try to get a better census of the likelihood of the solar systems amongst the universe. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here, even though following Didier is going to be a, a difficult act to do here. But what I would like to, to tell you is a story about uh, precision measurement or accurate measurement, which I think are the key in this whole business, as Didier already alluded to it. And again, uh, Switzerland is maybe well known for its precision in time measuring watches. Uh, here it is about precision in velocity and in brightness uh, measurement because the one gives us the mass of this object and the brightness will give us the size. So here it is. Here are the cast of character. Here's Didier. Uh, and uh, they've been awarded this Nobel Prize. And you see the citation on the right is their discoveries have forever changed our conceptions of the world. Now, I am sort of halfway a theorist, so I always thought that being an observer is easy. You just point the telescope somewhere, you see something, and that's it. Uh, uh, you, you get a prize. But, but here, <laughs> here, the difficulty is, is really, really, you have to see this. This is the result of a long, long, long time of effort in trying to improve and succeeding in improving the precision in these radial velocity measurement. It started with this Coravel Didier uh, uh, discussed. I was working on this, so this is sort of the kilometer per second. Unfortunately, I was too early. Didier brought it back down to 10 meter per second on LOD, which is the instrument that discovered 51 peg. The later instrument, I think, which was sort of the best instrument that has ever functioned in terms of radial velocity measurement is HARPS, that reached one meter per second. And last year, no, this year, was commissioned Espresso, the latest generation of this. But just to give you a feeling, one meter per second is a shift of the spectrum on the CCD of one thousandth of a pixel. 15 nanometer or equivalent to 150 silicium uh, silicon atoms. So it, it is really incredible that this can be measured, uh, really. But this is what you have to reach if you want to measure this precision. And we, we like the same diagram, apparently. Uh, basically, it illustrates the diversity of what has been discovered. And I think this is the big surprise 
that we all uh, did not really expect, but we knew it, it would be like this right after the first discovery, because that, as DJ said, this first discovery was so different from what was expected that we knew something had wrong, was wrong and we had to go back to the drawing board. So what we have learned that the solar system is not the rule. If somebody is weird in the universe, it's us, not the others. Uh, most stars have at least one planet, and smaller planets are much more numerous than the bigger ones. So I think this is the change of the vision of the world, uh, is we are uh, not the rule, and there are many, many, many planets out there. Now, this is sort of what we have learned today, 24, 25 years almost after the discovery, but things are just beginning. This is what is in the future for us. It's going to beyond discovery, and going, trying to characterize these planets to know what they are made of, the temperature, their composition, the surface properties, the water, and so on. So this is really where we are going with uh, next year, or well, maybe 2021, JWST, uh, then the big uh, gigant, giant telescopes that are being built today, which we'll see first light uh, during the 2020s. And I put little Swiss flags uh, there, where Switzerland is, is, is uh, delivering some instruments for these telescopes. We're not building the telescope. It's a bit big. It would almost not fit in Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but the instruments are of a size we can manage. So that's, that, that's fine. So, uh, again, back to measurements. And, and this is a field that has been, from the beginning, observationally driven. You recognize uh, DDS telescope here in the corner, but these are a set of telescopes uh, and satellites that have been used or will be used soon in, in furthering the field with, an, with the discoveries and later on the characterizations. And again, I put some little crosses there, Swiss flags, where uh, Switzerland has made some contribution. And there is one satellite I would like to, to talk to you a little bit more about. Uh, it is this one, uh, which is this Keops satellite, which is the first ESA small mission. Uh, and this small mission is under the leadership of Switzerland, joint leadership between ESA and, and Switzerland. It's the first time that Switzerland leads an entire mission. We've been building instruments uh, on all sorts of missions, many, but it's the first time where we had the lead of a mission had to be a small mission. You know, you can't get a big mission the first time around. So we do it a small mission. And this is the Keops. You see, it's about two meter by two meter size, uh, about uh, 280 kilo altogether. It was selected in 2012 by ESA committees. But actually, Didier and I uh, were put this a feasibility study of this uh, uh, mission long before the selection. It was 2008, and as usual with these space missions, they don't succeed the first time around. You have to do, try it several times, and you have to be patient and, and, and stubborn, and eventually it works. Uh, so this is it. Here is a picture of uh, the lab we have uh, in, in Bern where we built kelps. You see here, you see Happy PI there standing next, a bit disguised because the thing is a clean home. And then you see here uh, the telescope being mounted on the platform at Airbus in Madrid. Uh, and you can see that uh, how, how frenetic the, uh, the, the engineers get around the spacecraft trying to bolt the telescope on top of the platform. So what does it do? It measures transit. It measures the light, the intensity of the light of a star as a function of time. And the little dip you see in the light is when the planet passes in front of the star. Now, uh, this is a small dip. And I have here two recent examples of actual dips. On the left, you have Venus transiting in front of the sun on June 5th, 2012. Uh, and the decrease in light is a 75 ppm parts per million effect. I will come back to what that is in a moment. On the right-hand side, you see, you know, a week ago, Mercury transited in front of the sun. And here's the image. Now, the speck on top left is not Mercury. That's a solar uh, 
flare, it is, and here it is. I put a little zoom in here so you can see Mercury, right? It, it, it's, it's this little speck there uh, in reality, this big, uh, that you try to detect. Now, what you try to do is to measure the light difference from a star which is tens of light years away when such a little thing passes in front of it. It's tough. Huh? But this sets the requirement with, with which you have to make this measurement. If you don't meet that, you, you don't measure anything. And so Venus is, is, is uh, as I said up here, 75 ppm effect. It's slightly less than the Earth that passes in front of the sun. So uh, we wanted to have a 20 ppm detection for this mission. Mercury is a 12 ppm uh, effect, so this is going to be hard. This is not going to be possible, so let's just forget about it. Now, what is 20 ppm? Right? Uh, here, I've plotted for you a line with a million points in that line. There are so many points that you don't see them, right? So I can zoom in here, and here are the points. And 20 ppm are these 20 points. Right? This is how big 20 ppm are compared to you know, a normal signal here. And so basically, it's not much. <laughs> it's not much, and uh, it's a real challenge to measure that. And you can actually do it only from space. You cannot do it from the ground. And the thing, the worst thing you can, you realize when you build such a thing, that how is it that you're going to measure if you really can measure something to 20 ppm? So you go and find a, a, like a light source that tries to get you a signal that's better than 20 ppm, so you can realize that your instrument is measuring this or not. And oh, surprise, there are no light source that are stable to within 20 ppm. So we built one. Uh, so here it is, one that we had the pleasure to share then with the people of TESS who had the same problem in trying to measure light uh, stably enough uh, to test uh, the telescope. So now here's the organization of the mission. Don't look at the detail. It's just to tell you that Europe is complex. Uh, you, you have to reach large agreements with a number of countries before you can do anything. That's why it takes time, right? But once it goes, it goes. And so this is all the different, uh, the different entities that contributed to the payload. There's a consortium of 11 countries and then the European Space Agency uh, who has procured. And here's sort of an idea of the launch. It's a small mission, so by definition it has to be cheap. And here you see the shares of the budget and you see also why Switzerland. Switzerland is CH, uh, is, 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 is leading the mission because it's certainly the country who has invested the most beyond the space agency itself in, into this mission. And surprise, but worse to be noted, Keops is within budget and is within schedule in the sense that we are uh, launching on the first opportunity. We are passenger on the launch. So we are using the first available uh, ride, if you want. So here's the telescope. This is the thing. This is a telescope that's optimized to fight stray light. You see all the different passes here. You have a, ray, a light coming in, bouncing on the CCD, which uh, is a simple 1K by 1K CCD. So, you know, nowadays you have much, much, much more on your phone. So 1K by 1K is peanuts. But we're not here to do precision imagery. We are here to do photometry. So we just uh, believe that this is enough. And the whole telescope is about a meter and 30 centimeter long and weighs about 60 kilo. And what we want to do with it is all what you can do with a flying photometer from trying to measure that mean density of planets to try to look at light curves, trying to see if we find features on the transit shape, which would give indication that there are moons or rings. Discovery of planets, although there is not the priority, we will hopefully discover a few, but it's not really the, the, the priority. And we have a collaboration between Keops and TESS, we call CHESS, uh, and that uh, uh, we will try to do, and I'll show you in a minute uh, a slide on that, and then we hope that uh, 
a lot of our targets that we will measure with precision will be used as the big targets for the big next generation instrument. And why work with TESS? Because simply we are sharing so many things. TESS is a discovery machine. We are a follow-up machine. And you know, it's, it's like when you have bread and when you have butter. It's better when you put the, the two together. So, so you, can, you can really do. And even the sky's coverage is quite uh, uh, com complementary. So everybody <coughs> is happy with this uh, on, on this mission. So launch. Mid-December 2019, inofficially the date is the 17th, but I don't, I'm not allowed to tell it to you. So we just write mid-December. We will be launching on a Soyuz fregat from Kourou at seven kilo, 700 kilometer altitude. It's a sun-synchronous polar orbit. So every time it's dawn or dusk, Cheops will be above you, remember that. Uh, and uh, we will be living for about three and a half years. And here you see a few pictures of uh, Cheops arriving, the container arriving in his huge airplane in Kourou in French Guiana uh, for the launch. And when the thing launches, here it is. We jettison on the booster and here goes the rocket. Uh, at some point uh, it opens the fairings and it goes up. And here we go and then eventually um, Cheops is being launched in an orbit, and it's a sun synchronous orbit, so we will always have our back against the sun, pointing over the dark side of the Earth, so that you can keep uh, the telescope in the shade and minimize as much as you can uh, straight light. Okay, this is today. Now, it was already said that this was the beginning. Uh, it's been 50 years uh, between this moment, and you see uh, the astronaut setting up here the solar wind composition experiment. It's just an aluminum foil that you can buy in a grocery store. It was bought in a grocery store. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Budget was what they were, and, and so we couldn't afford uh, uh, something much more expensive than that, but it was well calibrated, I can tell you, uh, so that we knew what we were flying. Uh, so that, that's for sure. And they put it up there, exposed it to the sun, solar radiation or the protons and ions coming from the sun, struck the aluminum foil, got in there, captured, and they hauled the foil back, brought it back to Houston, and after quarantine in Houston, the foil came to burn where it was analyzed. And this uh, uh, was repeated several times because when you get something that works, you do it again. And so we did it five times on all these Apollo flights. And at the bottom is the time at, during which it was exposed on the surface of the moon. And the higher the time of the or exposure time, uh, the more valuable you get your science because the more of these things have been captured. So Apollo 11, although historically the most significant, is scientifically the least interesting. Uh, and uh, so this was it. And if you look at these experiments, uh, the first paper published here in 74 uh, remained for 40 years sort of the best measurement you had uh, for solar wind composition for a very long time. All this with an aluminum foil exposed a few hours on the moon. OK, so just to finish, to wrap it up, here is, couldn't talk about everything. I put you the solar system because I believe exoplanets are just one type of planets. Solar system is, is, are also planets. And if we understand one, we need to understand the others. We cannot have a theory or an understanding for one and, and a different one for the other. So here it is. Uh, all the objects in the solar system where uh, at least my university has been sending objects or instruments to make measurements in C2, including a comet. You may have heard about the Rosetta mission not so long ago. So summary, and I'm finished here, is... Uh, Switzerland is a small country, but has a long tradition of accurate measurement that goes beyond the space era. Uh, we, we, we build precision clocks 
uh, for a long time. Uh, the techniques are extraordinarily challenging to make these measurements, but the country has a large culture of high technology, uh, which helps a lot. And finally, you don't do anything without significant and stable funding uh, uh, within a research system. And I would, you know, when Didier says that uh, they, uh, nobody believed what they found, uh, one agency believed because they funded them is the Swiss National Sp uh, Science Foundation. And I must say that this was quite impressive for, for, for me is to say that, you know, during these 20, 30 years it took to really push there, this kind of research was, was, was funded, which shows that, you know, you cannot only do something that leads to three papers in nature the next day and then that's it. Uh, but you have to have the time to develop these things over time. Thank you very much. I'm just really happy to look out in this crowd and, and know that um, you all are as captivated by the science and what the science means as I am. I feel like um, there are probably people in this audience who uh, maybe haven't lived in a world where there weren't exoplanets that were actually real. But for me, growing up as a kid, the nine planets, that was it. And it wasn't even possible that there could be something on another star. I mean, that was truly science fiction. And then in my lifetime, this has just changed completely. And it's so amazing to me how a few photons, the difference of a few photons, can actually mean something so magnificent as an enormous planet spinning around another star 10 light years away. I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal. So I'm really happy to be able to invite up our panelists and have a fun discussion about the imagination and what those few photons have, have done culturally for us, thinking about our place on this planet, in our solar system, and in this galaxy. So um, I guess I'd like to invite up Didier and Willie. and George Ricker. He's the director of the Detector Laboratory and senior research scientist at the MIT Calvi Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. He's also the principal investigator for TESS, uh, the, the um, transiting exoplanet sky survey that we heard about just earlier. And Kim Arcand. She's an expert in visualizing the difficult to visualize and spinning tales of science that enlighten and charm a range of audiences from novices to experts. In particular, she leads visualization and emerging tech for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. And Prathama Muniyapa, who works at MIT's Media Lab, space-enabled research group. She specializes in alternative cosmologies and cultural ontologies as a way to expand the discussion around space exploration, <coughs> synthetic biology, and extended intelligence, which just sounds absolutely fascinating. So um, what I'm going to do is just ask um, our panelists, our, uh, George and Kim and um, Pratima, to go ahead and introduce yourselves. And, um, and when you introduce yourself, if you wouldn't mind telling me about a favorite non-Earth world that you have in your mind. So maybe this is something that you had, um, that you thought about when you were a kid or something that you've learned about more recently, an exoplanet of some kind. I, it's a little bit of an icebreaker and I'm curious about what everyone has to say about this question as well. So. Oh, I begin? <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I'm like, my work straddles this like odd Venn diagram between art, design, conservation, and, um, and anthropology. Um, I work largely with uh, indigenous groups, uh, looking at how indigenous cosmologies might better help us understand or develop a new and alternate ethics for space exploration. 
And the premise is really that, you know, the, the blanket expanse of space has enchanted the cultural imagination of nearly every civilization on Earth. And um, this legitimizes each culture's equal right to the, to the territory of space. And when you think about it, the history of astronomy, um, it's a history of receding horizons um, for some but, but it's not an equal history of receding horizons. Some countries are, are veteran voyagers in space, some are taking nascent steps. And for indigenous groups who've been really looking at the stars long before nations or corporations arrived on the scenario, for them, the horizon is still this very, very distant um, feature. And so my work tries to explore um, how how they've conceived of, of space exploration through ritual, through art, um, and through their cosmology, and whether embedded within their uh, imaginations of the universe, like like Nicole mentioned earlier with the Mapunata, who exist in uh, constantly in a state of space as an alternative reality, um, whether these ways of conceiving the universe um, um, gives us interesting ways to think, to challenge our present notions of space exploration, because other than the, the science and other than this like desire for scientific knowledge about the cosmos, like there is an alarming trend in the fact that space exploration is largely using terms like colonization, uh, extraction, ter expanded territorialization. Um, and these are the reasons why the, the narrative of, of space exploration is becoming real. The fact is also that we're looking to space exploration because in a very real sense, our territory is shrinking on Earth because of climate change. And so who better to learn from than our indigenous people so we don't repeat that mistake, don't use that language, and um, enter into a different relationship, I think, with, with the Earth and with climate uh, for future space exploration. Um, so my work essentially is telling stories of the universe using data and whether that story takes the form of a two-dimensional image or a three-dimensional model, a three-dimensional print or virtual reality application. It's all about taking something that was previously perhaps unseeable and making it seen to help understand things that were previously unknowable and help make them known. My work is also at the intersection of a few different things. I come from a bi biology background and then I segued into computer science and data visualization. And my PhD work was in essentially understanding um, spatially based data and how you can map that into three dimensional models and then 3D print it uh, or create a virtual reality application. So I think if I would say my favorite other worlds might be HD 189733, which is the most boring name ever. I think astronomers really need to work on that. It's very, very dull and hard to remember. Um, it's a, a K star about 65 light years away. And the planet that's around it, I guess if you could sort of zoom there in a spacecraft and see it, it might look kind of cozy and, and comforting because it's probably a mixture of blues and whites. Um, but it's nicknamed the Reign of Terror. Um, so it's one of those looks can be deceiving things uh, because it, it's got like 5,000 mile per hour winds with, you know, glass raining sideways and all this spiral sort of craziness going on in the atmosphere. And I kind of love that juxtaposition of something that, that looks like it could be Earth-like. I don't know if my mic is off. Um, but still has like such a surprise underneath. Well, I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background, um, and then I'll uh, actually like to show you something. Uh, basically, my interest in uh, astronomy goes back to when I was actually quite young. Um, my, my, one of my distant uh, great-great-grandfathers actually had a, uh, a telescope that uh, he actually used in the Civil War. And so uh, when he, he had a farm in North Carolina, and uh, in the summer, uh, my brothers and I would go there, and I found this uh, beautiful brass instrument that he had, and I appropriated it and went out in the dark sky and, and, and made observations. I was about eight years old at the time, and I got more and more interested in astronomy as, uh, as I became a little uh, more mature and able to do it, and I built 
a telescope, and I guess it's fair to say I've been trying to build telescopes all the way since. <laughs> and the telescope that's most recent, um, I would like to, that uh, a number of us have, have built, I'd like to show you a picture of, if uh, we can have that first slide. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, my favorite telescope. It's one which, uh, there is a team, this is TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And um, we first started working on uh, TESS, when I say we, Roland Vanderspeck, who's in the audience, um, and, a, and a group of seven or eight of us, uh, with the idea of repurposing another telescope um, that was in a satellite that we had built to detect gamma ray bursts back in 2006. And then we, we, we gradually uh, started to understand that there was a way that we could use the very sensitive cameras that we were building to um, actually uh, observe some of the uh, transiting hot Jupiters that uh, DDA and his team uh, had discovered back in the 90s. And then there were the, there, the idea became, well, transits are possible, uh, but if you want to actually see them, the only ones that we knew about at the time that we were starting to make these measurements were the ones that were Saturn or Jupiter size. So we, idea, the idea that we built on from TESS was that we want to be able to uh, discover planets that are Earth-sized and also planets that are relatively close to the Earth. So the configuration of TESS, as you, as you can see in this diagram, um, well, I'll show you this. This is the way that TESS observes. Uh, oh, great. There, there are actually are four cameras that are in that central portion, and, and you can see from the size of it that this is also quite a small <coughs> telescope. It's only about one and a half meters high. It's actually comparable in size a little bit bigger than Cheops, but, but not much. And the instruments themselves um, also weigh somewhere in the range of, of 50 kilograms, and the satellite itself um, weighs about another 200 kilograms. So the dry weight is, some, is a little bit less than 300 kilograms. So basically, the, the structure that you see was launched um, on a Falcon 9 rocket um, in on April 18 last year. And if, you can, if we can look at the, uh, at the next slide, this actually shows the way that TESS is actually able to observe the sky. The four cameras actually have a field of view that extends over about 6% of the sky at any given time. And then we actually look at a stripe that actually extends from one of the ecliptic poles all the way up to, the, to, the, uh, to near the ecliptic. And we basically sweep around every 27 days and in this way, we can cover uh, an entire hemisphere of the sky in, um, in, in about one year. The, as a result of these types of measurements, uh, we're able to observe a piece of sky that um, is 50% of the sky per year. And the overall uh, uh, rate of, of, of coverage that we have um, is about, uh, instead of looking at only um, a quarter of a percent of the sky the way that Kepler was able to do. We were able to look at the ent entire sky in a very large sweep and look for, th and thereby we can look for objects that are much closer to the Earth in general than was the case for, for Kepler. So if you then say, what have we seen? This is a very nice panorama that was put together by Roland Vanderspeck. This is what, this is what the sky would look like if you were um, uh, uh, lying back on uh, one of the uh, glaciers at on the on the on the at the, Antar the, the Antarctic Peninsula, just south of, uh, of Chile, with the tip, and then what you would see when you look straight into the top of the sky is that little blurry object right in the center. That's the Large Magellanic Cloud, and then there's a Small Magellanic Cloud around it. And then basically what TESS did in these sectors that you're seeing is it swept around the sky, 13 of those sectors, just as it was seen in that animation. And then this is what we have found in terms of planet candidates from the first year of the survey. There's more than 1,000 of them. And then if you then show the next slide, these are the ones that we already know are associated with planets. It's a relatively small number. It's 30 or 40 that you, that are, you see in this. But if we, if we extrapolate to what TESS can actually see uh, in the time that we have for the mission, the mission seems to be going very well. 
we can well envision it operating for another 10 years. So we're finding about 1,000 per year. So my favorite planet is going to be the one, that, the 10,000th the planet that we actually discover. <laughs> and uh, I'll take it, whatever it's like. No matter what. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. All right. Louis. Uh, you, you. Okay, well, I uh, don't need to repeat what you already said, so I, I will be brief. My favorite planet, uh, uh, I would be saying it's all of them. Uh, let's not make any uh, special things now, but it's uh, for me in a sort of self-centered way, it's 51 peg, clearly, because this has changed my life. Maybe not as much as his, <laughs> but, but in some sense, uh, it, it, it has changed my life because a lot of what we did, uh, chaos that you saw before and the rest of the work we, we did since 1995 sort of turns around exoplanets in one way or another. Uh, and, and without 51 peg, there wouldn't be any exoplanets. Uh, so, so maybe if somebody would have found one l much later, or I don't know. But that, that's certainly the one that, that marked myself and my life and my career the most. That's fair. That's fair. Well, I mean, that, that's, I mean. Cl that's clear that 51 Pain changed my life. But, right. but my favorite planet actually may not be the one that changed my life. That's the one, okay, I got it. I get this, all these changes. But I think the most, the most interesting one is the next one to come. The reason why, because that's what keeps us doing what we're doing. I mean, we're always trying to get something else. We're trying to get always more. We're trying to explore a bit further down. So there's always this excitement that keep, up, keep us going. And every next one is the one you like the most because that's mm -hmm. the one you're working for. So th that's a bit, it's kind of never ending story, mm -hmm. but that's, that's how it is. But yeah. uh, certainly the first one changed my life and but the next one keep me alive. Yeah. <laughs> 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 keep me employed <laughs> in business. Fatima, did you have one? Um, actually, I don't have a favorite planet, but I, I want to, I mean, because I remember where I was and h how I felt like my conception of the universe changed when I, when I discovered about the first time we, we fig uh, found an exoplanet. But I have, a, I have a story that I want to remark about, which is an anecdote, that in, um, when Mary Young was this anthropologist who was working with the Hopi people, um, around the time when the first man landed on the moon, um, she remarked to a few elders in the tribe that, you know, oh, today's a historic day, and just a few, like, few hours ago, a few humans walked on the surface of the moon. And uh, one of the elders remarked and said, oh, you only just got there. <laughs> <laughs> because um, for them, they'd been like through astral traveling or, or through dream traveling, that they'd been traveling there for a long time and that they had a history um, and a relationship with, with the moon. And so they said that it, the question was never when would we get there, but how would we treat um, the inhabitants once we did reach. Um, and so I just want to leave with that story. That's really great. I think the moon can kind of count as a planet in that story. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, that just that leads into this next question that's open for anyone to respond to. But it's the sort of cultural impact of uh, having so many, more than 4,000 planets floating around. That slide was fantastic, just the diversity of planets, the color. It was really wonderful. Um, and I wonder if any of you think that these discoveries um, have, have changed the way that the public and the public, however you want to define the public, uh, perceives space and also uh, Earth. And if so, how have you seen uh, changing perspectives manifest in your conversations with people about exoplanets? I'd love to throw something out. Yeah. Um, I was born around the time that the first Star Wars movie came out. And I remember thinking when you know you saw Tatooine, right, this dry planet around two stars, uh, or Hoth, this frozen world, or uh, what's the water world? Camino, Camino, whatever. Anyways, you get my drift. Um, for me, what where we are now, I feel like science has finally caught up with the art in a way, right? So we we've been dreaming of these places, 
uh, we've been taking ourselves there in some way or another through whatever the, the cultural mechanism might be, uh, whether through writing, whether through art, whether through other sort of experiential ways of knowing and understanding. And now it just feels like science has finally landed us there. So we're not there as far as visualizing it directly yet, but having the information about these other worlds has been incredible. And I did try to do a little scientific look, like I looked on Google Trends to see, you know, have the term exoplanets really picked up, and it has, like for sure. There's a huge spike in 2017 with the Trappist system, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and for sure, when I'm doing talks, exoplanets, even though I'm working in X-ray astrophysics, where it's more like black holes, exploding stars, things like that, um, but exoplanets, for sure, always come up in the questions if I don't talk about them at all. So yeah, that's that's sort of so my like perspective. It's like a confirmation of what kind of existed for right. a lot of folks anyway. Yeah. yeah. Scientists. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think that what, what we're doing is called fundamental research. So 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 it's always difficult to get an idea what is the impact of fundamental research. I mean, uh, most of the society has plenty of other stuff to deal with, which is much more important than um, this. I mean, this uh, about I mean, uh, and, and finding a house and uh, making sure your family is fine and having food and all this. And, and uh, certainly science is, is, I mean, telling exactly what is impact what you're doing, I think is impossible. And in a way, what we're doing is also related to the society we're living in. So there's a dialogue between the two. But, but there is eventually something um, because, because it, it, it diffused into the society and the society captured it. Um, but you know, I mean, it's, it's not stamping straight forward. I mean, there is a perfect example uh, right now, which is the global warming situation. So there is all this debate whether you believe global warming. It's for science, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, there is facts, that's it. You don't believe the fact, they are the facts. Uh, so, so there is this, this, the way the society responds to the fact, to the culture, to the knowledge, it's still something quite mysterious. I think mm -hmm. even these days when you have access to a lot of information. So I have no idea um, what we're doing, but, but it's a gift to the civilization, to the society we're making. We're telling them that all oh, their planet there. Um, and society has to grab what they can. And some are, are using that as inspirations. Um, for becoming scientists, or to do art like we had um, before. I mean, it's, it was a wonderful example. I mean, I really love it because it's connecting to Chile, and I know Chile so much, so <laughs> I really loved it. Um, um, and um, it's it's a difficult question, but um, I think it's a gift to human to mankind. Mm -hmm. um, we pick it, we don't pick it. That's it. Thank you. I I think that it's interesting that. Um, here we have data that is uh, very difficult for the average person to look at and see and imagine that, that, that this equals a planet. But this is how science works. We get, we get these bits and pieces of information and we extrapolate a reality from it. And so um, if we believe that this data is telling us that there are these planets there, we should believe that the data is telling us something very important about our own planet. And I think that those are conversations that, that are um, that should be happening, you know, that uh, you believe the science and there's uh, other science too that works the same way. So it's a really important tool in a way to, to show people um, what's really happening out there. I, I, like, I like that you kind of made that connection. Um, does anyone else have anything to say? Any, any experiences with the general public that just shows that well, things one, are changing? One thing I think you can, can say from the slides, for example, that DDA was showing is that um, we, you know, we, we live in a, on, a, on a planet that is, as far as we can tell, not typical. Right. And uh, so it's, it, it, it does give you the feeling that you know, we should do everything that we can to, to, to cherish this unique place that we've been given in the cosmos to live. Um, but the, 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 other, the other question that comes up when you then say, okay, well, can we, can we find examples in our own solar system for things that have really gone bad? We only have to look next door to Venus to see how, how, uh, how things can, can go wrong. Um, in, a, in a more positive way, the, the simple I, the, the idea of, of looking out and trying to find an Earth-like planet, we have, we have yet to find 
anything in, those, in that 4,000 planets that really we could say is an Earth-like planet. Right. We're pretty special. I think, I think one of the curious things about your question is how, how a scientific uh, discovery enables a cultural or a shift uh, mm -hmm. in cultural imagination or cultural re uh, revolution. But um, I think what's, what's really incredible about this is the fact that through narrative, through art, through, through cosmology, the reverse has also been true. Mm -hmm. I can think of a lot of lot of groups and a lot of communities that, that have always had um, an, an imagination of other beings and other inhabitants of other worldly realms. And in some way, I think the fact that people exist within this mythology and have access to this mythology makes it very easy. I think it softens that uh, the resistance to an idea that there are exoplanets and that it might, um, might have life in whatever um, m sort of method, not method, but whatever form that takes. And so it's, it's interesting to think that through literature and art that, that people are softened to receiving ideas mm -hmm. about what the data tells you. Mm -hmm. Right, like we've been primed, hopefully, exactly. to yeah. be ready for this. That's great. Um, let's see, one thing that I was wondering about was that, uh, you know, it seems like there are a lot of, that space is opening up in some ways. Um, like, uh, I think that there are more space agencies aiming for more places than ever before. We have cheaper rockets that uh, send up satellites, uh, smaller satellites, CubeSats that have art projects on them. It seems like there's something happening at this moment in time where more people have an opportunity to have a stake in space. And I wanted to get your opinions on that. What excites you the most about the diversity, the possible diversity of the future of space exploration? And how might that affect the broader cultural imagination. Well, I, I can. Uh, shall I? Uh, no. But good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Are these far? <laughs> no, that they, they, I mean, it is clear that that going to space, you can do from space things you cannot do from the ground. Uh, an easy example is Earth observing. All, all the data one can collect to prevent uh, uh, climate change and, and to help understanding what needs to be done can be done from space because you see from above what's going on. You can't, it's much harder when you're in the middle of it. So, and, and, and the problem with space is the cost. So, so clearly getting things into orbit, the kilogram of, of payload into orbit for cheaper and cheaper will allow to do many more things. Uh, uh, useful. Uh, now, there are some physical limits to things you can do uh, in getting smaller and smaller. You know, yeah, for example, there is no miracle. Uh, you need, if you want to collect a certain amount of light, the bigger the mirror, the better it is. So yeah, a, moment, um, a small mirror on the CubeSat will not do the same job as a JWST six and a half meter mirror. So, so there are physical limits to what you can do with, for certain aspects with small things. But the whole purpose, the whole development of space has been uh, in part at least made possible by the miniaturization of everything, electronics, mechanics and everything, and becoming light and small. And, and this is a natural trend that, that goes on here. And because we can now build things that are not that are small, not too heavy, that don't need too much power. Uh, we can imagine having rovers, small rovers on the surface of planets. We can imagine all sorts of things uh, uh, being, being possible this way. And, and the fact that it becomes more popular, and we see now uh, um, all these, these if efforts to make, put more things in orbit is partially due to the fact that it becomes cheaper. Mm -hmm. 
And what might we do with those rovers? I mean, science is a possibility, but uh, might there well, be... Well, for me, there? science is, is the possibility, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 that, that's, that, that's clearly what, what drives uh, sort of my way of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. But it's clearly not the only one. And many of these images that one sees... You know, when I was living in Arizona uh, a while ago, uh, uh, I had my neighbor coming to me and says, have you seen the latest picture of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, in the newspaper, right? These pictures, these beautiful picture of HST, made all my neighbor talk about astronomy. Uh, you know, pictures is something that captures the imagination of people, and this picture did a fantastic job, much more than any diagram you can show or, or, or anything. So, and, and this was almost art. Mm -hmm. And you look at, at, at some of these pictures, it's, 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 it's beautiful, period. And so uh, I think that is, uh, 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 science can be art. I might just, if I didn't break my, my, my microphone when I dropped it, I guess I didn't. Um, I might just add to that. So I think for me, what's been exciting over the past 20 years is, you know, I, I work for an observatory, the Chandra Observatory, that looks at the XR universe. So you're looking at things that are inherently invisible to the human eye. That information has to be processed into a form that can be then uh, looked at by a human. Um, but it can also be experienced in other ways. And I think what's the most exciting for me that has been a shift in how we understand and and facilitate that data translation process has been not just privileging the idea of, of sight, but also exploring through other senses. So um, data sonification, like we heard earlier, a different kind of approach to being able to understand data through sound um, or experience it through sound. Haptic technology, being able to understand it through vibrations, touch. 3D printing, being able to print this information in a way that can be explored by people who are blind or visually impaired. It's just a way of taking this information that we all have the privilege, you know, we all have the sky above us, right? We're all underneath that sky. So being able to be more inclusive in how we understand and process that data has been a really important shift that I've seen over the past, I'd say, at least five to 10 years. So it's not exactly an answer to your question, but just kind well, of a, a mean, side. Like a, a bodily experience of what space means. And that's right. something that's, that's pretty new. That, that, right. hasn't, that hasn't been the case. Right. What, what excites me about, about your question is um, like when we speak about the diversity of players within space, I mean, I even think of like space travelers, right? Like in the history of space travel, um, there have really only been 14 African Americans, one Native American, 11 Muslims, um, and largely it's just white male Caucasian. Um, and so to, to one extent, there's this idea that there's a lack of cultural diversity within uh, sp like space travelers, space players. But also one thing that personally gets me like radically, radically excited um, is the idea that we might even take this conversation beyond the level of species um, and that it's not just explicitly a human um, interest, I guess, in some ways, towards space. And this makes me think about what it means to have artists now engaging truly with space exploration. And I'm reminded um, of this incredible project uh, by JPL, and I forget the artist's uh, name, but it's called the Tree of Life Project, um, which explores basically a method to turn trees into radio antennae. And they have a 200-year-old satellite project that is essentially communicating with the trees of Earth. And this is a project that's actually, in a way, beyond human. Um, and takes this kind of like very myopic view of, of thinking about like meaning and discovery and knowledge um, that's just explicitly human. And to, to just change the conversation, say, could we be thinking of what kind of companion species we are to other creatures that inhabit the Earth? Um, I mean, the notion that there are tardigrades, um, you know, who are these like just unwitting travelers <laughs> is, is something that really excites me. And so to some extent, this democratization of of space technology is interesting also for ways that we don't, we, we as humans didn't imagine it. And it's something that gets me excited, even though it's a fringe um, well, statement. In a way, it just shifts pers 
perspectives, as you're saying, to remind us of um, our earthling nature and our shared earthling nature. You know, that's not something that's that's like specifically human and special to humans. Like this is truly a shared experience being on this planet, and that's really beautiful. Thank you. Well, I think in the interest of time, we should um, keep going uh, with the last question that has to do with, um, well, aliens. Oh, why not? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, in the room. <laughs> we have all these planets. We're waiting for that since yeah, the beginning. Yeah, right. <laughs> we have all these planets, and there's all sorts of things happening on them. Um, this is kind of a two-part question. So, uh, and specifically for the scientists, too, to think about um, how has the conversation over the course of your career about aliens changed since the um, discovery of so many exoplanets, but also um, biologically the discovery of extremophiles. I have a friend who's uh, written a book. His name is Ray Wade Roush. He's a local science writer, and his book is called Extraterrestrials. It's coming out. Uh, next April uh, through MIT Press, and we were having this conversation and earlier, and he said, I just wonder how, how scientists are talking about it now. It was so fringe for so long, and, and now things have changed, potentially. I don't know. How, what are these conversations like for you? Uh, first of all, for, for um, all of you when you speak professionally, but then I want to know what you say when you're not speaking professionally. When someone catches you off guard, they don't even know what your background is, and, and the conversation turns to aliens, what do you say? I say exactly the same. Okay. <laughs> well, tell us. So maybe what I'm always unprofessional, or maybe I'm professional yeah. on that topic. That's, that's so it's perfect. up to you to yeah. get. Now, there is something I'd like to say that, uh, in a way, it's related to your question. At first, this is a very good question, and there's nothing to be afraid to talk about aliens. It's a very good problem, and this is something, there's nothing off limit of science. Mm -hmm. so, so we just have to find a way to address it. So when we detected 51 PEG, I mean, it was, it was a hot Jupiter, I mean, roasted by the stars. But the first question that came is, what about life on that planet? And it absolutely struck us by surprise because we were not at all thinking about that on that planet. And we realized mm -hmm. that we just opened a book. We opened a big book. And all this stuff about Ho Chi Minh, it's fine. It was introduction of the book. <laughs> but the real stuff people really wanted to know about is about life on other planets. And actually, um, in a way, Detecting the first planet opened a while that questions. And it's a very valid question we keep asking. It's a tremendously difficult question because, because we have the perspective on the life on Earth. And you can always try to replicate what we have on Earth. So this is certainly the easy way. Mm -hmm. But given the diversity we have of this exoplanet, I think it's very likely that we may have some kind of diversity as well on the possibility of life on other planet. And today, I have no real solutions to, um, um, about how we're going to do that, but I know there's a lot of people that are trying hard to try to get the right questions or to address it. So, so I have no time to go through that, but there's a lot, lot of exercise right now, and there is a serious thinking for the next 20 or 50 years, how are we going to do that? But there is something which is going on today, is, is people are working on the origin of life on Earth, right now in the lab, and they're not far from reproducing the origin of life on, on, on Earth. And the best place when we likely we're going to find life is in the solar system, mm -hmm. because there's plenty of uh, other places to look in the solar system. And we're talking about this as a possibility on any, any planet or even satellite that we believe there may be something life. So this is going on. And I would not be surprised that in the next 20 years, we get a big surprise about the life in the solar systems, because we'll be there. And then we start getting some ideas what to do about life on the planet. And anyway, science is full of surprise. And maybe tomorrow there will be a press release of someone mm -hmm. that said that to find life on the planet. So it's part of the fun. But it's yeah. very serious questions, yeah. I think. A difficult one. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a certainly an old question, right? This, this has been around for quite some while. Mm -hmm. uh, what's fantastic for me is that we are now entering, we have almost the first generation that can have a scientific answer to that uh, uh, because we slowly have the technology that is required to go eventually make measurements or go send a satellite making probes on another planet in the solar system. Uh, so, so that is interesting. But for me, I think finding life, I hope we don't find it too soon 
because then what do we do? <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, so what I find interesting is, is that in order to detect it, we, had to, we have to study all what we study. All these planets uh, try to understand uh, what is favorable for life, what is actually defining habitability, uh, how can I try to detect this remotely or by going digging somewhere. So, so I think this is, this is for me the, the, the interesting thing, and, and I uh, it was not prepared, but I have a quote for that uh, of, of, of uh, President Eisenhower, who said at some point, the accomplishment will turn out to be the journey and not the destination. And I think this is typically uh, an example uh, where we have is, is the long work we do to get there, where uh, we will have learned something. If we find it too soon, what did we learn? That's it. Well, <laughs> I, th I think one of the positive uh, developments in this field is the, uh, this, when you speak of aliens, there's been this idea for a long time of passive listening, um, the, the idea of SETI, the search for terrestrial, uh, for extraterrestrial in intelligence. That, that idea was, is something that's been uh, pursued actively and, and uh, there was, I don't know how many people remember this, the Golden Fleece Award from uh, in the US uh, Congress uh, for that, that caused a lot of skepticism for that. But, but the, the idea now uh, is, is something that's widely considered by I think almost all scientists to be certainly something that we should not only think about but, acti but actively pursue. And in fact, uh, as, it, as it were, the, uh, the idea that's related to this has been sort of relabeled techno-signatures. That is, uh, it takes a little bit of the sting out of it being search for aliens, but, but look for, the, for, for indications that aliens are actually there. And I think that's a very positive development because one of the things that it, that it opens up is that rather than having a very narrow view of what uh, life or intelligent activity is um, in the cosmos, you really look for indications that are not necessarily life as we recognize it. But it might be life of the, of, uh, in the same style that if you were to come back to, to the Earth a millennium from now, you probably wouldn't recognize many of the, the things that you would see as necessarily indicative of, of life. And you, know, you can do some rather simple, I mean, there, this is a, obviously a, a big theme in science fiction. I mean, all of us, I'm sure, have read, or most of us probably have, have read uh, stories of, of, um, of structures and, and there's this thing called, this, this idea of Dyson spheres and Dyson shells. And, you can actually make calculations now of whether you might be able to see uh, some indications of, of these uh, looking in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and then more you know, closer to home, there's this idea that's been uh, brought forward that if you really do develop probes that we can actually send out to the nearest stars, um, the, the break, Breakthrough Foundation, for example, you could send out a, a probe if you develop um, tech technology for you know small iPhone type systems that are that are propelled by powerful lasers on the Earth. I mean these are things that they're technologically extremely hard to do, but it doesn't require brand new things that we just don't that we can't conceive of doing. So the, so all of these things I think are possible, and so the question of you know what what are we going to find if we if we try these things? I think that's the next question, but. Uh, you know, being being uh, being a scientist, I'd I'd uh, I'd really rather go look and see rather than necessarily spend a whole lot of time speculating about what might be out there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, sure. First, I guess I'd just say that when I'm daydreaming about what I might want to be when I grow up, astrobiology is sort of always a thing that's in the back of my mind. And whenever I give a talk, and I'm usually again talking about X-ray astrophysics, so black holes, exploding stars, almost every single time. Somebody will ask a question about aliens, and I love talking about it. What's interesting about a telescope like the Chandrix Observatory is it was already built by the time your paper um, came out. But still, even with that, you can use X-ray telescopes to be able to understand the host star of these 
exoplanet systems. And that can help you understand yet one more piece of the puzzle for the potential habitability of one of those planets in its system. So for me, I think what's really interesting is just how much, since those first papers started coming out, how much has changed and how much like accumulative knowledge um, has been able to be gleaned from these telescopes and from these initiatives, some old, some new, and all trying to guide us towards finding those little pieces of the puzzle. Um, something that, that really blew my mind a few years ago when I heard the director of SETI speak um, was that she said, I imagine this thought experiment if you were, if somebody was alien life was looking back at Earth, if they looked at the Earth about 60 years ago, not only through um, through reading the techno signatures, would they be able to um, predict that there was life on Earth? But they would also be able to predict that there was culture mm -hmm. on Earth, because uh, all the different countries had their own unique kind of radio signatures, and that it was only about 40 years ago that we passed this international law to like standardize it and make it all uniform. Mm -hmm. But um, I like, I mean, I really appreciate the magic of this moment that we can say that not only can we ask questions about whether there is life on Earth and science will lead us to some extent towards the direction of an answer, but that we can ask much more complex and nuanced questions, like is there culture somewhere out there in the universe, and that's super exciting. Yeah, that's a great example. Thank you. Well, should we open it up to questions from the audience? Not, not this time. I'm sorry, audience. Um, I think that there is a, a reception. Uh, but I would just like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists so much for their thoughts. And